We're going to call the meeting to order at 6.04 p.m. If everybody could please stand up to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Agenda item is the recognition of Don Collins receiving the Stafford Bell Award. Um, who's got control? I know. Congratulations, Don. It was some really excellent pictures. I don't know if everybody saw them in the St. Albans Messenger of Don with his awards. Great achievement. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It was uh, a surprise. Supposedly they had mailed me a notice, but I never saw it. <laughs> so I walk in the conference, and as they introduce all the different vendors there, I'm coming through to find out a little more about the guest speaker. Flip to that page, and there it is. But no, it's mm. nice. They don't give it every year either. It's quite interesting. They've given it only 13 or 14 <coughs> times in about 30 years. But it's nice. I want to thank Remit. He did some photography. You, I think he was in Julie's phone or something, maybe his own. Uh, it, was my, it was my phone. I, we had it. to make sure to capture the moment. It was a big deal. <laughs> so anyway, it was, it was nice. And I've received over 200 emails or phone calls. I stopped counting when I got to 200 emails, phone calls, and some letters. The best ones, well, they're all nice, but from students I had like 50 years ago. Wow. At Lamoille. That's cool. Yeah. So they remembered. One, one woman wrote, I remember the junior high dances where you made us follow all these strict rules. <laughs> but then, then they'd come and ask you to dance. Anyway, no, very nice. Um, but you know, it's one thing, whether you're an administrator, school board member, whatever, you never really accomplish anything if you don't work with a team. And uh, I had some real reservations on a site like when we tried to merge Swanton, Highgate, and Franklin. Would it, would it really work? Well, I have to say it, it really does work. And I think it's because of the people. I mean, facilities is a good example. I don't always agree with Peter, but Peter, and mm -hmm. if it's Toby or Remick, well, no, we work it out, though. Yep. We respect each other's knowledge, and we have different knowledge bases. So. Anyway, thank you for putting it on the agenda. I feel badly for Julie. Is she there or somewhere? Not yet. But, uh, she's there. Thank you for, for doing that. Uh, it was good. No, congratulations, Don. That's uh, well deserved, and I think for uh, new board members, and I know it's certainly true for me that uh, you are someone to uh, look up to and learn uh, how to do this job. So I, I appreciate all your uh, your work that you've done for this board as well. well thank you. Just don't take my bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> Next agenda item is correspondence, visitors, and public comments. Do we have anybody that would like to make? I mean, is that us? Yes. <laughs> um, um, the art department. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. No, it would be um, like Chris and his wife. <laughs> no. We're, uh, we're just They're with me. Oh. <laughs> They're my posse. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And nobody online? All right, perfect. And then the next one is the agenda review. Julie, do you have anything? Well, I just want to make the point that uh, Peter wants to give an update about the filters. Um, and we didn't, it was kind of late to add it to the agenda, but when we're talking about crack tractors and uh, the roof, if, if we can make a point of having Peter give an update on the cost of uh, the air purifier filters and so forth. Okay, be so great. We'll add that as under 10 item, item D. Thank you. Next agenda item is the approval of the minutes from October 24th. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from October 24th. Thank you, Peter. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Renick. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries 
eight zero. And moving right along, we got administrative reports. We got the MPU co principal updates to the board. Is there anything that you would like to highlight from um, your report? I don't think so. I would like to thank uh, Principal Martin. I really enjoyed all the things, reading about all the things that you've either brought to the middle school or you've promoted. It, it, for me, to be honest with you, the middle school kind of came alive. I loved middle school when I worked there most days. Uh, but anyway, but it was good. It sounds like a lot of exciting educational things, and school has to be fun sometimes, so I wanted to congratulate you. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Do you have any update or any more information on the FFA trip? I know we approved that uh, a month or so ago. <coughs> I think they're going to be coming. Are they coming? I think they're going to be coming in. I don't know. Okay. Joanne might know more today. Yeah, I, they will be coming. December. Okay. okay. December. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say next month. Yeah. The one person I talked to said they had a very good time. Yes. I don't know if that means it was a good trip or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it was a good trip, and it was um, they were honored in, um, I don't want to give it all away, but they did receive a bronze medal, um, and and they brought back a lot of information, and there was there's a lot of talk already about, you know, next year. So that's always good. Excellent. And just a reminder, I always like to remind everybody about skit night coming up. <clears throat> it's always something to really experience, to, and that's the 16th and the 17th. Um, I can't praise how great the kids do, and uh, so I just always highly recommend to people if they can attend that. Okay. And administrative reports, uh, this we got MVU, which, um, Dan is out, but we do have his report, and I don't know if anybody had any comments they'd at least like to make on the report. I'd also like to know what's happening in preschool. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy's not biting on that one. <laughs> All right, moving right along to central office. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she heard you. Hear Back then? They can't hear us. It'd be, no, like, it'd be Wendy. Uh, did anybody send you the two words? <laughs> no, but I'd love to hear what yours were. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought my two words were exciting. That was the first thing that came to my mind. But it was the second word. I really had a hard time deciding between about five of them. but. I, I think probably uh, the thing that I thought the most was the commitment of the, what, that, that you said the staff had. I mean, I didn't see it in action, but in your words, the way you talked and the things. So I guess I'd say commitment and exciting. And I, I worked hard to find out who said that. Burette saved me. No, the TV technician saved me. I said it. I, I, I beat him to it. <laughs> but I was impressed that he knew. <laughs> well, thank you for completing the assignment, assignment Don. You got an A+. Plus. <laughs> and I really appreciate it. I think those words resonate with me as well. And uh, we had a great meeting today in Central Office with Laura, Julie, Marnie, and uh, the after school assistant, Holly, and myself. Uh, consolidating all of the information that I gathered the past couple weeks in my individual meetings with principals and site coordinators. And we are now going to do a deep dive into a couple options to bring to you all as far as what the future could look like. So uh, yeah, I agree, exciting is, and commitment for sure. I had to confess and I have to say to Devin, who's the young lady on the right? You, <laughs> you look different on the screen than you do in person, I guess. <laughs> all these filters, man. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay, any other questions or comments for Central Wendy, office? did you have an update about preschool? 
And you did. I think I heard Dan ask, Dawn ask the question. I thought I heard him ask too, and I went to hit unmute and we moved along. So I didn't want to interrupt. But yes, I did include in the report this month information about the changes to the state's um, quality rating system for licensed early child care and preschool programs, which will have an impact on us in the coming year. Um, this is a year uh, where the Child Development Division is um, going through the steps of the new process for um, programs to go through and create a portfolio um, and demonstrate their continuous improvement efforts. And um, it's a no fault year. So we are not due to renew our stars um, in our three program sites this year, but I would recommend and we'll be speaking to the building principals and the um, site leads at each site that we participate this year. Um, being a no-fault year, we can participate and learn about the new portfolio process and um, still maintain our current level of STARS. And I think that this recommendation um, is a good one because not only will we get a chance to learn the system and learn what is expected of us and be set for another three years and have three years to work on our improvements to put into our portfolio, but it will also allow time for the child development division to work out all of the kinks of this new system. Um, parts of it are being developed in process of being developed while programs are applying. So that would be my recommendation and I'll be working with our site leads and our principals to bring them all up to date. What I will say is that it is going to be a substantial amount of work compared to the current system for us to demonstrate quality. Um, the previous system was heavy in paperwork and checking off boxes um, and um, would require you know a few days worth of work to prepare for uh, your submission every three years. And they are advising now that um, the new portfolio system is going to require um, probably months worth of work each year um, to curate what you put into your portfolio. So stay tuned for more information. Um, it's a new system and lots of folks across the state are learning about it, both home providers and center-based providers and of course, school-based providers. We're all learning about it together. We're all asking the questions together. We're all attending webinars together to come up to speed. Um, I will make sure that we have all of the information that we need in order to move forward with the new system. Wendy, is this an attempt by someone or some group to kind of, uh, I'm going to use the word destroy, but that's too strong, but to uh, stars? Because you know when we put stars in, there was a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. Yeah, I don't think it's to, what I think um, and what I've heard is that it is to shift the focus from being able to check boxes that indicate quality, but may not actually play out as quality in in actual classrooms and experiences for kids and to push the field to actually engage in activities that really do um, accomplish high quality environments for students, uh, for children in programs. So that is what um, I've heard in several of the um, at several of the tables that I've been at a, around this and that was feedback. So this is actually an anniversary year coming up, Don, and you, and you know this, this is actually 10 years of UPK um, in 2024. And the feedback in this two year, 10 years has been that this, that there are programs out there that would have four and five star ratings um, and that experiences in those programs didn't really equate to what one would expect at that level. And so this new system is hopefully going to really accurately reflect when you have four or five stars that that is what children are experiencing every day um, and all children are experiencing that. So 
Um, that's what that's what I think it is. I don't think it's going away. We need to have some quality rating system in place um, as part of all of the pre-qualification process for uh, UPK. Um, so I don't think it's trying to push it out, but just to have it grow toward, I think, more of what it was intended to be in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Hi, Kosha. Um, I had the opportunity to sit on the Student Success Committee this week, and there was a lot of good information that was presented. And I just wanted to ask if there's anything you want to highlight from uh, your curriculum report. Uh, I tried to give an update on all the different things happening in our curriculum, but what I really want to highlight is we are currently in the process of uh, investigating different reading programs that we would like to adopt for our district. We are following a very similar process as we did for the math program last year. And our literacy, uh, elementary literacy coaches are working really hard with me to go visit different schools, as well as to look at research reports. And uh, we are also consulting with Dr. Sarah Lupo to really come up with something that will support reading in all our elementary schools. And just like Wendy said, for all our students, um, especially our students who are in those vulnerable populations and who need additional support. So we are looking for a program that is high quality and also has supplemental um, parts to it, to it which we can use to uh, help all students. How were the visits? I noticed you've been doing some visiting teams. Have they been worthwhile? Yeah, they've been great. And um, we just finished a visit in Burlington uh, last Friday. Uh, and uh, Stephanie was wonderful, uh, really helped us to look at different parts and how they rolled out their program. We've been to Winooski. Uh, in spring, we went to Maple Run, and we also went to Grand Isle. So we are using all our regional partners to see what they've done, how they've rolled out their programs, what does it look like in the classroom, and it has been a really good experience. Good. <clears throat> Thank you, Kosha. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Peter? Just um, wondering, and I don't know who wants to answer, but I uh, was wondering how attendance is doing, how uh, many students are missing, whether it's because of sickness or overall. I know we've struggled with that in the past. Is this year an improvement, or is it getting worse? Or? It's not getting worse. Um, Right now, our numbers are slightly worse than they were last year, but not not significantly. Um, there has been a lot of students sick this year. We've had um, some students out for a you know chunk of time for different kinds of reasons, but very legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still some of those <clears throat> same um, students who struggle to be here every day that we're working with. I actually met with Celine right before I came. Um, she stops in. We have some students we're working on together. And um, so she's, you know, right on it, checking all the time. We're um, following up, reaching out to parents, trying some different things for some students who just have a really hard time being here. So I, um, I would say that the numbers around the district are slightly better. Um, at the middle and high school, they're very close to what they were last year. Um, and some of those are some special situations that had they not been in there, we probably would have been doing a little bit better. So I don't, that's sometimes I have to be vague because yeah. it might identify a, st a student, but. Yeah. It's, it's, I would not characterize it as worse. Okay. 
Who's coaching the math league or advising the math the team on the math league? I am not. I was really pleased to see that. Yeah. Let me. Um, Lauren Tillotson. Is it Lauren? <laughs> yeah. I think Thank it's you. Lauren Tillotson. <clears throat> Lauren Tillotson. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't know. Not sure. I know. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on, we have our presentations and discussion items. And first up is our MVU Art Update with Lindsay Didio. 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 Close. <laughs> Where do I stand? Okay. Yeah. I got a little overzealous with the slides. <laughs> There's just so many pictures. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm from uh, the art department. Um, I'm also the department leader. Uh, my name is Lindsay DiDio. Uh, I'm pretty much all over the school. If you ever see me, that's I'm running around. Um, you can click it. Um, so I first want to talk about um, the Artist in Residence Young <coughs> Artist Recognition Program, which is something that four of our advanced art students participated in the spring and summer of this past year. Um, one of which is here, and you'll hear from shortly. Um, but if you've been in St. Albans, there's a gallery downtown called Art Artist in Residence, which I'm also a member of. Um, and they do a monthly uh, gallery featured artist where the artists have a gallery talk and you know, it's a beautiful night. Um, and we can nominate, <clears throat> excuse me, middle and high school students. I think it starts at age 12 to 18 um, to also participate in this recognition they submit a work they come in they do a little gallery talk in front of a bunch of strangers and fellow artists they people ask them questions um, they're all very nervous but it was not scary right it really wasn't that bad um, and then the piece that they submit if they're chosen for this program gets hung in the gallery for a month um, <coughs> and if they want to they can put it up for sale so there's an opportunity to sell their work and be a working artist which is a really nice experience so um, I just wanted to honor these four three out of the four have graduated and have moved on from MVU but Katie is still here so this is Katie she was a junior last year senior this year um, so she was one of the recognized artists last year hey Katie, uh, <laughs> Katie. <laughs> you're gonna hear from them um, at the beginning of the school year, um, just like all, all of the other teachers in the building at MVU, we really tried to in, uh, start with social emotional activities with our students. A large part of the art curriculum is very hands on. It's very social emotional. Like it just they just weave together very easily. So my colleagues um, Josh Sins and Joe Smith. Um, the other two art teachers at MVU, as a collective, we did this large collaborative bulletin board with our students with paint chips. These are the paint chips that you see at Sherwin Williams. Um, I've had a giant case of them for years, and we've done this before, and uh, it's always a really nice bulletin board for the beginning of the year because we don't actually have artwork to hang yet. So it adds a little color to the hallway. Um, but we have a conversation with the students about what is our what does it mean to them? What does it look like to them? And then they make a little illustration or they can write on it, like a little journal. And then we make this beautiful rainbow of everybody's thoughts and ideas of like what art is to them. So this was a bulletin board for the first couple weeks of school. Go ahead and change it. Um, this year, we've also had visits from a couple college reps to my classrooms. Um, so I teach the advanced art classes in AP art. Um, and a large part of that conversation is talking about like, what are your plans beyond high school? Doesn't have to be college. That is one of the conversations that we have. Um, and so I've had representatives from the Maine College of Art um, and the UMass Dartmouth campus, the School of Visual and Performing Arts. Both of those colleges <coughs> have visual and performing arts, four-year degrees, two-year degrees, majors, minors, and all that. 
Um, so we've had some lovely people come in and talk to us about those programs. Okay, middle school. This is Josh and Joe's territory, but I'm gonna do my best. So in Mr. Sims's class, so he teaches eighth grade? Eighth grade art, middle school art. <laughs> to me, they just both teach middle school, so I always forget. Um, so Josh teaches eighth grade. Um, he is working on some mixed media, acrylic spray paint, um, texture pieces, like what you're seeing on the far left. The center one is a digital piece by middle schooler uh, exploring pixel art. And then the one on the right is an acrylic kind of abstract mixed media painting. Go ahead. Um, in Mr. Smith's class, and he is our, our new faculty member this year, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in these pictures, he is doing, I think these are seventh graders. They, eighth graders. These are eighth graders. <laughs> they okay. all just look like middle schoolers to me. Um, in this picture that you see, they are preparing paper mache pumpkins that I know he taught about the, um, the artwork of Yoyoi Kusama, who's a <coughs> Japanese um, contemporary artist. Um, she makes these really giant pieces. Have you ever seen the paint with the, the or works of art with polka dots on it. That's probably you know, like Kusama that you're looking at. So they did these really funky pumpkins um, in his class. Go ahead and change it. This is some more of Mr. Smith's pictures, some more of his pumpkins. They're also working on some clay sculptures in these. Um, and then the image on the far right are uh, 3D paper sculptures. Go ahead and change it. Okay, high school art. Here we go, here's my forte. So in the drawing classes, they started the year with um, what I like to call skills tests for the first couple weeks, where these students have, most of them have not been in my classes yet. I have not te taught them. I don't teach middle school, but so by the time they hit me and their junior, or sophomores or juniors in high school, I've never seen their, their work, so I don't know where their skills are. So we started with some skills checks. Um, and then our very first larger assignment was this. It was the Memento Mori assignment where students learned about a little art history, the history of Memento Mori, of Vanitas paintings um, and artwork and the time period that really existed. And then they go through the symbolism behind what are in these pieces. And these are two works of art um, by one is a senior and I think a junior, I think. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the one on the right is a senior, and then if you look really close, the the one on the right, it's a dead horse laying on its side. <laughs> it's it's supposed to it symbolizes that isolation and feeling alone, you know, in this vast. That's the whole point of Memento Mori. So it's that reminder of your humanity. Um, so yeah. So that's where we're draw drawing is starting this year. Now they they just finished up portraits, which I think is the next slide. So here's two examples of students who have drawn portraits. Um, the one on the right is a self-portrait. The one on the left is a portrait of their friend. Um, but yeah, both graphite pieces, uh, junior, sophomore and a junior who have done these pieces. So really proud of them. The fabric on the one on the right is wild, so good. Okay, you can go to the next one. Okay, and then we also have a painting <coughs> class. So again, painting started with a skills check in the beginning of the school year. Um, and then we started working with acrylic and gouache, which is kind of like watercolor and acrylic had a baby. That's kind of what kind of paint it is. Um, the image that you see on the right is a tiled portrait. So each student in the painting class painted two of those tiles. And then we put them together as a larger picture, which I just love. I'm like obsessed with that project. It's kind of abstract, looks a little different. I just think it came out so great. Um, and then the image on the left are Pantone color cards, which are about that big, pretty small. Um, and the students, we talked about color theory for this assignment, and they chose the card, which is that Pantone color 9320, which is the pink, right, Katie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's that pink color in the background of that those are actually two of Katie's paintings. Um, the pink color in the background on that card, and then they were asked to paint something that is that color kind of sparks and associated with that color. So people would take, 
you know, a red card and they painted strawberries on it or something like that. So they were connecting the color to the subject matter. Uh, so yeah, so there's painting. The, those are actually still hanging in the, you can see them on your way out tonight if you go past like the J-Pod entrance into the theater. You go out that way, it's hanging up on the bulletin board out there. And then in AP, we have nine students enrolled this year. One is submitting a three-dimensional portfolio. Three are submitting drawing portfolios and five are submitting 2D portfolios. Um, we have two students who took AP last year who are taking it again this year, which is an option. It's not like they didn't pass and are taking it again. Um, but they loved it so much they are taking it a second time. Um, uh, so in this, so far this year, students have begun writing their sustained investigation statements, which is essentially the, their thesis statement for the year, which their body of work is going to respond to. Um, students are exploring a range of topics, such as acts of kindness in public, isolation, environmentalism, propaganda, and using images of construction sites to show <coughs> storytelling and the connection um, to nature and death. Go ahead. This is where our AP students start. So if you look at the image on the right, that is one of their sketchbooks. They start with some research. They look at artists who also create work in kind of that theme. Um, they do some brainstorming thumbnails in their sketchbooks and then kind of hash out what their idea is. This is, this is an acrylic painting um, on a piece of sheet metal and it is a response to um, this is part of the environmentalism theme. It's a response to an oil spill. So she was thinking about connecting her materials and the synthesis between the idea and the materials by using sheet metal as the substrate that she painted on because of it reminded her of like the big, sh you know, oil rigs that are made out of metal um, and when they spill and bust open, all of that. So if you were to look at this piece in real life, there's also some like metallic copper on, uh, paint in there that really makes it shimmer that kind of really looks like it's an oil spill. Um, so this is an example of <coughs> one of the earlier AP pieces this year. Um, okay, Katie and Brooklyn. So now I'm gonna hand it over to these two lovely humans. Um, Brooklyn is our, I'm the president, nice to meet you all. New president this year and Katie is our vice president. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was already introduced, but I guess I'll introduce myself again. Uh, I'm Brooklyn Rainville. I'm the president. Uh, this is Katie. Yeah. Uh, I'm Katie Shepard, the vice president. Where's, where's the first door? Hmm? Go ahead, you can change that. Oh, Blue shirt. Sorry. We have to yell at me. So um, these are our officers. We vote on them every year, and it's basically just a way to kind of um, shift responsibility onto the members of the club and teenagers. Um, it gives a lot of power and it kind of helps for teenagers to uh, represent themselves in an organization that's ultimately about uh, teenagers. Uh, yeah. Uh, so these were our members um, slash officers. Um, as you can see, I'm the president. Katie's there as the vice president. And then we also had um, Vinny and Amelia as our historians, which means they document our service, service events. They document um, like field trips we go on. And then we also had our secretary, uh, Sander, who um, documents like attendance. Does the vice president do attendance or secretary? The vice president does it if the secretary is absent. Yes. But the secretary's main um, duty is attendance. So they take attendance, they keep track of um, what we talk about during meetings, stuff like that. Um, our, generally, everyone helps with agendas, everyone helps like kind of run service events, stuff like that. <coughs> so we can go to the next slide. So we also participate a lot in field trips. Um, we, uh, last year we went to Bread and Puppet, which was a studio space for different artists to kind of collaborate, um, which was really neat. We got to go to their studio space, see how they worked. We got to see um, like these huge puppets. They're like three feet tall, which is like something you don't see every day. Um, so that was neat. Um, and we also helped pay flyers and kind of help them with their traditional duties. We also went to Montreal uh, for the day, and that was fun. We went to an art museum. We did a scavenger hunt, which helped us kind of navigate the museum and see the different art pieces available. 
Katie had some stuff about that too. Uh, we did do the scavenger hunt in the museum, and then afterwards we got to um, explore the Montreal area. And so we got to continue the scavenger hunt looking at the architecture and the culture and any art in the area. And so we got to see more of Montreal's culture through the scavenger hunt and just being able to wander around and go in stores and try the food and all of that. Yeah, uh, it was a very interesting experience. Again, art that maybe not isn't as popular around here because we do live in like a smaller county so it's kind of hard to experience some of the uh, artistic culture you know uh, we went to recently we went to the prom at the Flynn uh, which is a musical about uh, a girl who wants to go to prom uh, it's implied by the name so <laughs> um, and that was fine that, I shouldn't say fine that's not very like uh, presidency um, <laughs> But it was a really fun time, and you know, we got to see volunteers who were adults and in college, which I think is a really inspirational thing for uh, high schoolers who do um, volunteer theater. I think it's cool to see where that hobby could lead them to. You know, uh, yeah. We also went with the the music and theater department. Was that was like a combo yes. trip? So it was the two of us that went. Yeah. Um, and then upcoming, uh, today actually we went to the Fleming Museum at UVM, which was another really interesting experience. Um, it, as opposed to Montreal where we saw art, a lot of art that may not be available around here, uh, UVM had a lot of art that kind of showed like what students can do if they stay in Vermont and decide to pursue art, which I thought was uh, really interesting. Um, there was a lot of stuff about native culture, specifically Abenaki. I know that's a really important thing for our school, so I think that's a good thing that members can see, like, uh, represented artistically. And yeah, do you have anything to say about that? Or? Uh, a nice aspect of going to this local museum is that there's a lot more art pieces that could be personal to uh, some of the artists who went, and it was open to um, all art students, so it wasn't just the NHS going. Um, so it was a good opportunity to see kind of like culture from our area and to see opportunities in our area. Yeah, and then we also have um, another visit to Shelburne Craft School, which I assume, I don't know much about it yet, but I assume we're going to be seeing studio space. And yeah, that would be like uh, BCA and the Shelburne <coughs> Craft School I'm working on getting like a day field trip where it's hands-on, like they'd be in the pottery studio, they would be weaving things, they would be doing something in the wood shop. So, yeah. so trying, can, I'm working on it. Yeah, working so we can see how artists actually work, which once again is really good if a student wants to pursue the art, they can see like what a artist who makes money looks like. And then Katie had some stuff about Art Quest, uh, basically her experience last year. Uh, we are planning to do Art Quest later on this year, but in a past year, uh, we did Art Quest in Burlington on Church Street, and it was a great opportunity for us to see Church Street in a more artistic lens, and we got a chance to see the art displayed there, the murals, the statues that are all up around the street. We got to look at like the some of the stores. Maybe we went to those before, but now we could see the like art stores they had there with local Vermont art. And we got a chance to leave some of our own art, leave pages of our art in books in the libraries or on like car windshields just to give away to someone. And so I think it will be great to do it again. You can go to the next slide. Oh, oh wait, we want to like your New York trip. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can talk, <laughs> I can talk about that one. Um, so we're hoping that next year in the spring the NAHS will be doing like a f relatively long um, four or five day trip to New York like that's that's our goal so we're doing lots of fundraising so you know keep that in mind um, to get them down to New York so this is an image from uh, prom. prom yes yeah, so this was a group photo taken outside before the show uh, I'm in the front looking sufficiently awkward and <laughs> cool. um, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, it. That's We're, it, yeah. Now there's just a bunch of pictures if you want to um, yeah. flip through, we can tell you when they are. This is from this afternoon. Yep. They were not thrilled I made them stop and take a group photo, but I was like, <laughs> I need something for my son. Yeah, and then there's uh, some students looking at Asian-inspired art. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this was in the Asian art gallery. 
Yeah. Which used to be the reading room way back when. So that used to be a reading room. You can kind of get the vibe of a reading room with the big arched window. And um, it really felt like a reading room. Like they had built these stub walls to put work on. But it felt like there should have been big loungy armchairs and things in there. Um, but it's a cool gallery. And then this was last year at Bread and Puppet. So once again, you can see me looking sufficiently awkward. Uh, this was uh, towards the end of the trip. Um, just us taking a group photo again yeah. to document that yeah. we were here. It was a lot of fun. They they painted, like Lions. Brooklyn had mentioned, we, they painted posters. And part of what funds Bread and Puppet is the sale of that artwork. So we were, the kids were uh, contributing to that, right, to that. Um, process. They also got to meet Peter Shulman and he made them um, his very famous garlic aioli and the, the bread that they serve, the sourdough bread. So they all got to try it. It was actually fabulous. When you go to an event like the prom, can every student go, who wants to go? How, how do you determine who goes and who doesn't? Uh, typically it's kids who are associated with the drama department. Um, so if you are very active in the artistic community, usually you'll hear about it and that's how you know to get the permission slip. Personally, I tend to be involved with the backstage aspect of the musical and so I was invited to the Google Classroom um, and that's why I heard about it. I don't know if like random students would be able to go. Would that be a thing? No, I don't think so because that one was like specifically paid for by the support <laughs> program and by like the NHS. We paid for the busing, um, and then the money for their tickets came out of the theater budget. So, yeah. um, and same with like our Flynn field trip today. We paid for the busing out of the art program, so the, any art student that was in a high school art class was able to go. But like um, a random kid would be right, but like Joe Schmo, who just wants to go hang out with their kid or their friend, <laughs> probably not. So when you say we pay for it, you mean the school district pays for yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, like it came out of the art budget. I was hoping you weren't uh, having to raise money. To <laughs> no, 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 no. I'd uh, be talking to Mr. Lumsden. <laughs> <laughs> So this is another photo of um, Asterix Montreal at the in front of the museum. Um, yeah, this was actually really fun because we went, we invited the BFA St. Albans National Arts <laughs> Honor Society to join us. Um, so Dee and uh, brought her, all of their kids. There was like I think fourteen or fifteen of them, and about twenty. We were packed on that school bus like sardines, and it was very hot. Um, but it was a lot of fun and they got to meet, you know, kids that are down the street that are normally our rivals, but really we all have the same interests. So it was really, it was a really nice day. Um, this is an old photo. So this is from like 20, well, 2021, I think it was, I think the blue white year of NAHS and we were, we finally got to do our quest again. And so this was their teams. They were in team, their color teams. And it was kind of like the Amazing Race. So we set up like the Amazing Race but art version on Pine Street. And we worked with studios and artists in that area and hid clues. And they had to like figure out riddles and like, oh my god, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. But that was, those were their teams that, that year. Uh, yeah, so we NAHS also does a lot of service projects, uh, specifically art related. So we obviously we did the feather project for Indigenous Peoples Day, where st children had to write um, things that things on feathers, uh, things that they learned on Indigenous Peoples Day. So we will be hanging that up for an art installation at the school. Uh, we also knit hats. Do you want to talk about the hat knitting since you? Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> since Katie's pro knitter. Uh, last year we knit a lot of baby hats to donate to the hospital, but since they're not accepting them anymore, we're knitting hats to donate to homeless shelters and to people in need. And we are kind of broadening our variety and we're doing hats, we're doing scarves, and we're crocheting granny squares this year to make a blanket that we can donate to. Uh, and it's a good way to earn service hours, and it's a good way to help people in the process. Yeah. Katie's insane. She has she's knit like a hundred. <laughs> isn't she with like hundred and ninety five hats? She's like yeah. amazing yeah. at it. Yeah, so fast. Oh. She's like. Oh. <laughs> we also uh, made bookmarks for the library, so students can take those um, student designs and use them for reading, obviously, because they're a bookmark. Um, and then 
we're also currently painting ornaments and making various things for the MBU craft show. Um, so, and we're also poised to help set up with that. And then finally, students will be painting a mural for the music room in order to kind of spice up that environment for kids who are interested in band and chorus and all of that jazz. Uh, and we also create the designs for it too. So yeah, and then obviously we do the art wall every year, so that will be kind of more towards spring, summer season. What are BTV winter markets? Um, it's the the Burlington, uh, Vermont winter market in City Hall Park. So I am one of the artists at the market, and I was going to have them come and help me do like the setup and like help the day, so they can <coughs> kind of like see what that is like. And then I realized that I have no room in my booths for two other bodies. So they're not actually going to be coming, <laughs> coming to help me, but I didn't have time to fix it. Something like a neat idea. Yeah, it, I think at a different event, it would work really well. Um, but the booth size is so much smaller than a normal 10 by 10, like, you know, farmer's market tent. There's just not enough room for three bodies. To <laughs> so why don't we do one in downtown Swanton? Say again, I'm sorry. What did you say? I said, why don't we do a winter fest painting festival in downtown? That would be awesome. That'd be a great idea. That's a we great idea. Local, uh... I'll find you a space. <laughs> talk to the Swan Arts Council. So here are some photos from our community service projects. Um, I know the bottom right, that's us painting the mural. Mm -hmm. um, for it's the Depot. mural in Depot. Yep. And then we also have the one to the left is us with the art wall mm -hmm. um, that we recently painted. And then the top two. Um, is the top the left is also from last year. They volunteered at the SACA, it was like a winter festival or something. So that's the St. Albans Community Arts. They had um, the military band. I forgot what it, which one it was. United States Marine Corps band. Maybe it's the one that Aaron Garso's son is now. Oh, part of. Yeah, 40. they were there because he was there and was like, "Hey, how you doing?" And like, you know, <laughs> trying to like get his name in. So they came and played. There was like, some vendors there. There were kids' activities. They helped decorate cookies and moved chairs, and then helped vendors carry tables and stuff to their cars at the end of the event. And that was a lot of fun. That was a and full I, day. And then I assume the one on the right top right is the donating of the baby yeah. hats and stuff. So that's a couple of years ago when we were, this is pre-COVID, so this is a while ago, when we were still allowed to bring the baby hats into the birthing center at the Northwest Medical Center. They could like actually physically, so they used to like wrap the boxes, you see it looks like the snowman, they had, it was like their favorite day. We would do it right before holiday break um, in December. And then the nurses, if there were any moms that, new moms, they would ask if it was okay, and the seniors and the officers, and depending on how many moms were there, would bring them in a couple hats, and they got to like pick them. Um, but now Northwest Medical doesn't even accept hats, baby hats anymore because of germs, and, but so UVM still does. But. Yeah, and now we've transitioned to making gray squares for like bigger quilts. Yes, and stuff. Stuff. Like, yeah, as we try to adapt. Uh, we can go. And then this was our induction ceremony uh, last year. So this was really interesting. Boy, I've talked about the interesting a lot in this speech. Um, but we had um, a glass speaker come and talk to us about her craft. So once again, seeing a local artist talk about how she makes a living. Uh, and I believe 27 kids were inducted into the Honor Society total, which was a lot. Um, most of them have graduated now, but obviously that gets that number kind of gets replenished as younger kids kind of yeah. come up. We also have 27 this year. Um, and you're welcome to join us on May 15th for our induction. You're always welcome to join us. Yeah, and I think that concludes our... Yeah, there's one more thing, but I'll take this one. You guys are good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, last thing, I promise. You didn't think the art department would have this much to say, did you? Um, okay, so I would love for as many of you to come to this event as possible. We just got the VPA to approve a brand new um, and sanction a cheer event. So I'm also the head cheerleading coach, um, and it's hosted at MBU. So it's the first time we're having this event. It's a brand new competition. It's on January 20th. Um, it's for youth, middle, and high school cheerleading teams from the whole state. So we'll have, hopefully, people from the south, from Rutland all the way, you know, coming up here. Um, like we said, the NAHS induction is May 15th. Um, we are also hosting a second competition this year, which we've hosted three other times. 
um, but it's the Vermont Cheerleading Coaches Association competition, the BCCA, which again is a statewide VPA sanctioned event. Um, the every single year we've hosted it, well, one year we hosted it was during COVID and that was virtual, so that doesn't count. But the two years that we hosted it on site, every single seat in that gym was filled. We had to open the doors because it was getting too hot because there were so many people. Um, we had to tell people they weren't allowed to come in. People were sitting on the floor. Like the gym is full because we get so many teams. We had 46 cheerleading teams the last two times we had it in person here um, show up. And it is wild and it is a fun day and it is enjoyable. So I encourage you to come. Um, we will also have the Spring Youth Art Show, which we've been doing with the Swanton Arts Council for many, many years. Um, we have not solidified a date yet, but that's usually around the end of April, right before break. Um, and then Fine Arts Night is May 22nd, which is where chorus, band, and studio art, um, we all get together and have like an awards night, they do performance, we put up a show. Um, so we started combining those things last year, so this year it will also be May 22nd. Does anybody have questions? <laughs> I think that's it. Yay! You're good at sports. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or comments? Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to put the pressure on Mr. Anderson to even come close. <laughs> come on, Lummy. Pressure's on, right? You, mean, you don't have to talk about the cheerleading competition. I already yeah, did. I guess I know what I'm going to <laughs> well, thank you for coming to share with that presentation. <coughs> Ladies, thank you as well for coming. We appreciate it. Yay. Uh, thank you for having us. Yeah. Appreciate it. There's a fall with a beard of pending artist. Yeah. <laughs> I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. I don't know where she gets her talent from. Yeah. <laughs> what Welcome, Chris. <laughs> Thank the students for coming. That's yes. always great yes. to yes. see students. Absolutely. Makes our meetings better. sent a link out to uh, members of the fall uh, athletic director report. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, good. Yep. Uh, I don't maybe really need Jerry, to maybe? everything. Maybe it's Jerry. Um, <clears throat> but it does a few things. I just want to highlight one. Uh, our biggest increase in participation was in cheer. Lindsay does a great job in that cheer program. And uh, this year, for the first time, we were in, ended up having a varsity uh, girls volleyball team and I just thought it would just be one varsity team it turned out there were enough uh, student athletes in that group that uh, there was enough for a JV team so uh, that JV consisted of uh, 12 young ladies there so it was a, a boost to that program um, some dates that we had some meetings uh, our new soccer scoreboard which was 30 years old uh, we ended up replacing that this past summer but prior to the season starting uh, homecoming week was uh, just a lot of fun. It, uh, I've had many coaches and I've had some parents and uh, say that you know the parade, uh, feeding you know 335 kids, uh, pizza and drinks and having them decorate their floats and wearing their uniforms and having the parade through town is just a highlight for that day. So uh, a lot of positive feedback on that. We will still continue to do that. Uh, the NVAC cross country, country, cross country race was held on a Friday this year on October 13th. About 545 runners from 15 high schools participated. Uh, thank you to Ken Sandemore, the cross country team, coaches, and parents for making this uh, a successful event. Recapping the varsity teams, you can see where our teams ended up at the end of the year. Uh, many of our athletes were recognized in the Messenger for Athlete of the Week and many were chosen for the all league selections of first team, second team, and honorable mention. Um, I had a young lady who was interested in 
uh, organized a cancer game, so her and I and the team ended up doing that, raising $775 for a cancer center in New York City. Um, and then we had a powder puff game at the end of September, raising over $30,000. Uh, this year, we are still continuing to look for an athletic trainer, but this past fall, we did not have one. However, uh, MBR, Mississippi Valley Rescue, was able to uh, cover some, uh, cover three football games, <coughs> and along with the NVAC cross-country race. Uh, winter signups have begun, and as of last Friday, there were 201. I just looked this afternoon, there's up to 206. Uh, winter athletes who have signed up were a little below average of where we would like to be. Um, in a, one sport is girls basketball, where there are 14 girls who have signed up um, in girls basketball. That's enough for one team, but not quite enough for the JV team. So I have a winter coaches tomorrow night, and we'll be discussing that um, and how we're going to figure that out. Uh, Dan Palmer and I just came back from a two-day uh, leadership council meetings uh, in Burlington, and we ended up taking eight student athletes there. Uh, that was a great time for the last couple of days. Uh, once again, my winter coaches meeting is tomorrow night, and my middle school basketball team started last Thursday with the high school winter season starting the Monday after Thanksgiving, November 27th. John, why shall feel girls basketball? Uh, last year, there were two eighth grade girls, and we could see this coming a year ago. So they moved up to ninth grade. Um, I don't know the reason. Um, it's just a low number in that grade. and. Um, so we'll see what we can do to Because it's not, I'm, I'm asking, it sounds like I'm saying, but it doesn't appear that there's a lot of other sports teams in the winter compared to other seasons. I mean, are there more opportunities so they don't go to basketball because? Um, I don't know if there's more opportunities. I don't think, I mean, I, what little I know, I'd say there weren't, but. Uh, you're right. Um, I, I don't know what those kids are doing. <coughs> So it's hard to tell. Um, you know, our eighth grade girls, I've got 22 girls that are playing basketball, so that will get better next year, uh, where we ended up having to hire two coaches for that sport in, the, in that grade. So it's just one of those years that not much interest. I really don't know why, so. So John, you have <clears throat> volleyball, basketball, and hockey for your winter sports. Right? Uh, so I have hockey, uh, cheer, cheer, indoor, Track and field. Okay. Yeah. Boys and girls ice hockey, basketball. Yeah, volleyball's a fall sport. Volleyball's a fall sport. Yep. Okay. It's a very busy fall with 20 teams, so. I was surprised with your numbers in volleyball. That's really common. Yep. Yep. And girls' volleyball is really, really taken off. Mm -hmm. So. But how many, how many um, other teams have volleyball teams so that they can compete against? Um, was, there they're... are, yeah, there are, uh, I think, 18. Oh, wow. In fact, that yeah. group is so large now, they're talking about maybe dividing that into two groups, what we call a, a metro division and a lake division. Because I remember for a while it struggled, the program struggled to get um, up and running, and there was maybe two or three other teams that they could even play. Right. So it's good yep. to hear how much that's grown. Yeah, it really has grown. Yep, in fact, uh, Middlebury, Missisquoi, Hardwood, with the three new schools, were able to get into that last year. So it, it is it is growing. Well, that's good. And how do new programs get introduced and possibly taken up by a school? Like yep. especially with winter and there's not many options, especially mm -hmm. if you don't play hockey. Yep. Um, if there's a group that's interested, yep. how what so is that? So I process always look to like what what the sport is, mm -hmm. uh, what interest is there, um, the number of people that might be interested in doing a sport. Um, and then coming back to the board to find out what we can do uh, to create that position and, and fund that position. Volleyball's fairly new, right? Yeah. Remember you're coming here just a few Yeah, we had a few years of, uh, we did three years of like JV volleyball. But a lot, but this past year was the year for us to jump into, into varsity status. And so what we like to do, we want to, <clears throat> let's see what the program's gonna look like. Yeah. Sometimes that interest might be there for just maybe juniors to seniors and then they leave and then maybe there's not that yeah, younger group that's interested in doing it. So we want to be able to sustain that program. We also is have to think about play? like is it, is it based on a student saying this is something we want or is it? Um, uh, yeah, I think generally. the students. I mean, that's how the, the actually the JV uh, boys volleyball team started. They 
wrote me a letter saying, "Here's uh, we're interested. How can we get going on it? How can we make this happen?" Okay. So yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John, go ahead, Peter. I'm up, but I think you're going to say the same thing. About no, go ahead. I've got a few questions. Okay. So Peter's chair of the facilities committee. Remy is on the facilities committee. I'm on the facility committee. Toby was, but Toby's not now. He does come in some, but he's ending his tenure on the board. He says, but uh, I guess I would say that <coughs> we're discussing short and long term range uh, plans for our athletic fields. Mm -hmm. That they need attention. Yes. And that uh, hopefully you'll be an integral part of that. I know we talked with Jason, but, uh, and I'm not one to judge them, but apparently that uh, there's a much, not much that can be done. Uh, so uh, hopefully you'll be an active participant. And so we'll hear it both from a building and grounds, which Jason's very good, yep. and from the athletic viewpoint. Yep. So yep. Peter, you're the spokesperson for. <laughs> it sounds like. Uh... Jason's already got, or probably you're involved obviously too, a, a parking plan uh, yeah. to try to get a control of parking so we're not parking on the athletic field. Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah. exciting to see. Now I got just a few questions. Um, really excited to see that uh, you had the cross country meet uh, here. Um, I know uh, when my son was, was running, uh, a lot of the other schools love to run here. They get PRs. They they love that. So uh, it, and it, I think it shows good for the for the school. So mm -hmm. uh, really happy with that. Um, and the you gave an update on the uh, playoffs and stuff. And and the high or the uh, football team didn't make the the playoffs, but you said they're still successful. Um, I know in past years we've had issues with injuries <coughs> and not having enough. Players to finish the season. So, are the numbers better this year? The numbers were much better this year. Uh, last year, towards the end of the season, uh, they had, I think, 14 players at the end. This year, they had 24. So, nice. there's that interest, and uh, you know, they worked hard. And um, so, do we have a feeder program now? Do we yeah, have middle school flag football. Okay. Uh, is a sport that uh, middle school students can sign up this year. I think they're at 18. They played several teams, Milton, Mount Abraham. Uh, which I think they went to a Jamboree in Milton as well. So uh, they wear everything, the helmets, the shit, you know, the, all their equipment, uh, but it's uh, padded flag, we call it. So that program should be getting better as years to come. So Isn't the rec doing a youth program Yeah, Yep, well? I think they're doing a youth program as well. That should yep. help. Yeah. So you'll start to see, hopefully, yep. numbers improve even more. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Um, so yeah, Don talked about the, you know, our goal to try to improve the or two about the process of hiring new coaches. Um, how is that working yeah. out? So this past uh, winter, a couple of weeks ago, I just hired two middle school uh, boy soccer, uh, boy basketball coaches. Um, <clears throat> and I'm holding off on the JV position now until there's going to be a team. Okay. So. Uh, but it was only two coaches this winter. But otherwise, we've done really well. This mm -hmm. season has probably been the <coughs> best one as far as staffing goes. Yeah. Um, we've been doing the letter of intent process where we send it out like a couple of months before the season to find out if any of the coaches that we wish to invite back will be returning. And then if they don't, John and I meet and we post the positions. Um, but that worked out. That's been yep. working out really well. So then we have the commitment ahead of time and we know. And then the coaches that he did hire, have to hire for the middle school, actually came up from the elementary schools that they had coached at prior. Mm -hmm. So. Um, That's why I was hoping we're starting to get better quality coaches by being mm -hmm. able to work yeah, on it. Yeah, retain the ones that we want. Um, John's doing the evaluations now. We started that last spring. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Hopefully so we'll, it's yep. we, we work very closely. Yes, we do. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Sure. Like There's one other issue, and you met, you're probably in the loop, but Laura and Julie have been working with Earl Fournier, a chair of the select board in Swanton, about land where we have our, our cross-country trail. Okay. And she can, she, I don't have to speak for her, but anyway, we, we don't have a full answer, but the facilities committee came up with a recommendation 
uh, to what land we would like to have them donate to us. Okay. So it would be school district land. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had any, I don't think we've had any recent feedback because we only did this like a month ago. Okay. But the town seems to be very uh, interested in cooperating with us in making that happen. Whether we get all we want, we'll see. But okay. at least we'll get some. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Any more questions or comments for John? Thank you, John, for the update. We appreciate you coming in tonight. You could walk the art department. You could join the art department. Good. Thank you. I can't draw a straight line either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Next agenda item is our budget presentations and discussions with possible action. <clears throat> First up is Act 127 presentation, changes in education funding and revenue. I will share my screen. Laura and I were gonna practice today and go over who was gonna take which slide. And then that fell out the window. I completely, when I fell over. I completely changed the PowerPoint after I listened to the VSBA BSA meeting today anyway. <laughs> so. Can Julie hear us? Absolutely, I can. I heard a little bit about your accident, and I had a comment, but I'll share it with you privately sometime. <laughs> it was a very graceful moment. A stepper fell winner. <laughs> Do you still want to oh, no. take every other slide, Julie, or you want me to just go? I am happy to do that, and you jump in when it gets uh, mathy. Okay. <laughs> I, can, I can start with the first one, and then you, you can go from there. Okay. That sounds good? Yes. Uh, get this stuff out of the way here. Can you see it, Julie? I can, thank you, and I have it up in front of me on another computer, too. So, uh, people have been talking quite a lot about Act 127, which is a bill that uh, went into law a few years ago. There was a long period of study and discussion and models of how to uh, adjust the way tax rates are calculated and how we count people's so that it is more equitable. And this is the year that it comes into practice. So the main idea of this study and law is that different types of pupils cost different amounts to educate. We had weights that have been in place since I think the 80s, but they really weren't in any way tied to what programs you have to offer to kids who are living in poverty or kids who are English language learners or, you know, any of those different pieces. So the idea was that equalized pupils really should make the average cost per pupil the same as it would be for an elementary pupil. So that really a shifting of how much it costs to educate different kinds of students. Currently, the equalized pupil process counts pupils in identified categories by adding weights to account for cost differences. There were lots of discussions about categorical aid. Special ed is a categorical aid, for example. Um, but instead, we are getting different weights for how many students we have in different categories. We have uh, different weights for preschool, elementary, secondary, pupils living in poverty, students who are English language learners. This will change for FY25, and it's adding some new categories. Also, we're switching from long-term weighted ADM. We're switching to that instead of talking about equalized pupils. So, Kelly, you'll be fine, because you haven't listened to us talk about equalized pupils for years and years. So this will be new learning for everybody. So it's, you know, but it will be a shift in the way we talk about the budget. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, you want me to take the slide. I thought you wanted me to, I thought you wanted me to go to the end. This is not math. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so it's fine. Average family, oh, go ahead. Okay. 
So the long and short of it is that the, the calculation um, is, is basically the same to provide funding to the ed fund, um, but as Julie said, instead of using equalized pupils, the divider is now um, a long-term weighted ADM. Um, so a long-term, the two pieces that we need to know about as we work through this calculation is average daily membership, or ADM, that's the number of publicly funded resident students in the district as a 20-day FTE. So we work with Rusty to, to determine who that is, and we have to report that to the state already. Um, but that's basically the, from the 11th to the 30th day of school. And if a student is there for that full period of time, then they count as one ADM. Um, Long-term membership, the average daily ADM for the current and prior year plus state place students. So we establish a long-term membership, and that's uh, if for next year will be uh, fiscal year 23 and 24, along with state place student headcount. Laura, has the 20-day thing changed? Uh, no. I know they, they Not started. Not since I've been around. Okay. Yep. All right. Because at one time it started at the beginning of the year, and that was a real headache because schools couldn't figure out particularly in high schools, if right. the kids were here or not, right. because they might be working. Mm -hmm. so, okay. And like kindergarten starting later than so the other school That's good. Right. Phase, so. Isn't it still, I thought it was still at the start of the school year, like October? October 1 is a different count that we use oftentimes. Um, oh, you mean kindergarten starting or? The ADM. Um, it's the 11th like through the 30th day. October 1 is another day, though, that's very oh. important in reporting. <laughs> we, good. we like good. to use Monday. lots of different things. <laughs> Yes. Uh, it's also important we were talking about state place students. Uh, state place students are students in the custody of uh, Department of Children and Families whose parents do not reside in one of our towns. And we don't, we don't have a ton of, of those, no. but they do give us that number as well. So the intent of these new weights and categories, um, a district advantage by the new weights and categories in terms of long-term weighted average daily membership will have lower spending per student in long-term weighted ADM and subsequently a lower homestead tax rate. This district should be able to increase its overall spending to provide additional support for students in various categories. This will raise spending per long-term ADM but also the homestead tax rate. But the district should be able to fund more services for our students at or below the tax rate that it would have had without the new weights. So essentially, because they're adding categories and they're adjusting uh, how much a student who's uh, living in poverty or uh, a student who's an English language learner, they have adjusted how much that student counts. And so school districts who have a lot of students in those <coughs> categories will have greater tax capacity so that the community can support those student needs adequately. That's the purpose of that. Um, the intent was not to have districts have a tax break um, and not provide adequate services to kids. For a school district that's disadvantaged by the new ways, a higher tax rate will be required to maintain that same level of spending, and they are going to have to make adjustments over time to come up closer to the middle, ideally. So under Act 127, um, Julie spoke about the weighting categories. So the new categories um, are the grade level, which is a long-term membership, the poverty, free and reduced lunch status, and that's actually um, more than that. It includes um, basically any students that receive some kind of food subsidy in the state. Um, sparsity and population density, um, which is, um, well, it's, I guess it's kind of self-explanatory, but we used to get a small schools grant. Now they've separated that into um, a small school weight, but also a sparsity and population density. And we do, we MDSD will be re receiving funds in that category. Um, and English language learners, which is actually not um, calculated with an ADM, that's an actual head count. <clears throat> um, the weights do work in concert with one another, so oftentimes if one is going up and the other is going down, by the time you get to the final calculation, they can kind of mask each other. So I'll break those down for you later on in the presentation. Wasn't a lot of this, well, I know I've been working on it for 10 years, I guess, but it, this is supposed to help maybe rural areas a little more than 
some of the other yes. situations. Yeah, I remember Julie. Well, just yes, yeah, services are harder to provide in more rural districts. Yep. Things aren't just right next door. Transportation and and uh, the ability to hire specialized teachers to support English language learners, for example, uh, those are harder to do when you're in a small school or farther away. Julie and I were at the SBA a few years ago when we had the speaker. She did a the the person the the key person in collecting this data is out of the University of Vermont. I can't think of her name, but Tammy uh, Colby. Yeah. Did it, yes, Tammy Colby. She yeah. did a, a lot of uh, research to develop this. Looked at how education is funded across the country, uh, and we all gave uh, a great deal of feedback into that report as well. So you can see just quickly how the weights are shifting here. Um, and I don't need to read it to you. I'll just point out some of the biggest differences. Um, yeah, well, um, yeah. I noted at the bottom, um, and this is actually one of the, the biggest uh, factors that's impacting the potential for MVSD, but poverty weight, weight per ADM went from 0 0.25 in the in the current year, or what, what we're doing now, it's going to a dollar three per ADM. So that's that's a huge jump. Also, English language learners. It's an I, additional dollar three, correct? For 1.03. It's turning into 1.03, going from one yeah. from 0.25. Also, English language learners. I believe it was 0.2, and now it's moving to 2.49. We don't have a large amount of English language learners, but um, we actually, I believe, will have. We have seven as of October 1 on this year, so um, uh, there's actually a separate piece of, a, of this process that will allow us to obtain a small grant, a well, small $50,000. Um, there's different brackets depending on how many students that you have, um, but we will be in the lowest bracket, so we will receive the highest amount, which is 50000 on top of this weight in our ADM. Um, because they basically know that to provide services for any ELL student, whether it's one or 20, you have to have a certain base of um, um, support services. So yeah. we have to have a teacher, we yeah. have to have supplies. So they just, they are, they're kind of compensating us for that. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. Or can you make that a little bigger? Because I don't know that people will be able to see the recording on it because it's Pretty significant number. Won't let me on the. Okay. Because I'm sharing my screen, it doesn't seem to want me to do that. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Derek. Do you want me to take this one? It's very. Yeah. Well, so Laura <laughs> spent some time. She'll go through how she did it, but she spent a good deal of time. We have to calculate. If we were using the current weighting system last year, what it would look like, and then forecast what it would be for FY25 so that you can make a comparison. Why don't you talk me through that? Sure, and I will just I, I put a note on the bottom, but these are estimates for 25. We don't have the numbers yet, so we can't do the calculation, but this is based on what we have um, so far. Um, but basically, we start in the first column with the long-term ADM plus state place that we talked about. You can see here from, um, it's, an, it's a two-year average, so in the current year, we would be using 22 and 23 if the law was in place this year. And our um, long-term ADM would be um, you know, 1,799. Um, if we use fiscal year 23 and 24, the long-term um, ADM plus state place would be the 1827, which is an increase of 27.89. So our base, so to speak, is increasing. That's not true for all schools because some have declining enrollment. We do not. Um, so that's, that's helpful. We then look at the grade um, weighting um, and um, uh, it's based on these ADM numbers here. So in these top columns, you can see that we actually are increasing as well. Um, but you can see that the weight is going down. Um, so we're going from 236 to 226. So we're having a decrease in weight of 10 even though the count is going up from 18 to 2054. And that's because um, we do not get weight for the elementary students. Elementary students are the base. 
And so that is our higher population right now, and some of the um, smaller is in the high school where you're getting the extra weight. So it will be advantageous to us later on when those kids move up and we're receiving the extra weight, but for right now we're actually losing 10.22. Free and reduced, uh, or the direct cert list, which is the poverty weight, is um, something, a category or a factor that's really going to be benefiting MDSD this year, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is the additional weight that we talked about in the last slide, so we're just getting a lot more weight for these kids in these categories, um, or the ADM in these categories. But also, if you look, we had 661, basically ADM, that, that um, qualify for this weight, uh, last or in the current year and it will go up to 1011 um, next year in fiscal year 25 um, that's a jump of 360 and the reason for that one I do believe that poverty obviously is increasing in our area or that the portion of our population but also since universal meals was put into place and all students were receiving meals for free less families were um, likely to um, provide us with free and reduced price hot lunch applications despite all of our efforts. Um, and so last year and over the last two years, our free and reduced price um, percentages went down significantly. Some were um, in the high 20s and then to the 35% free and reduced. We are now in most of our schools over 60% and some are as high as 65. Um, and that um, a lot of that is because um, the direct cert now the direct certification list now includes Medicaid students, um, and that did, wasn't the case before. We would have to report on get those that portion of the population to fill out applications, and that's no longer necessary. Uh, and that increased our our Good. percentage significantly. So, that's a good. so we don't have that fluctuation <coughs> that we had when we had to fill out forms. And right, and we actually are in our second year of the SEP program too, so this will be our base year. So hopefully, moving forward, we won't have to do that at all. Good. But this this will this extra weight is definitely going to impact our um, tax capacity next year. It's a more accurate reflection of our student population. Exactly. Well. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And then ELL, you can see the current year we we believe we have nine. This year twenty five. We have we have seven, and so that we are actually losing a little bit of weight um, with our ELL population going down. But as I said, because we're under um, seven or under, we are actually getting the fifty thousand dollar grant. So that will. Um, benefit us as well. The next weighting cal category, sorry, I'm losing my voice, is um, is sparsity, and so um, you can see we're actually gaining slightly in weight. That's just because the weight changed, um, so we're getting 1.95 extra weight. Um, <coughs> we are actually losing our small schools grant, which is about $68,000 a year because you can't receive sparsity and small schools, um, but. Over, all in all, I believe the school district will be made whole. It's just in a different category. What, what determines sparsity? Is it related to transportation? It's, it's um, basically residents per square mile. Right. Um, and then there's just yeah. different categories up here. Okay. If you're less than 36, mm -hmm. but I'm sorry, more than 36, but less than 55, or more than 55, but less than 100. Um, and that's the one that we fall into. You would think with all the property that's up there at the refuge, we'd our sparsity would be an advantage for us. I do know that they're um, currently working with the census office to gather new data, and it'll be interesting what that looks like. I don't know what year or what when this data is from. Um, so overall, the total weight you can see from 24 is um, we'll, basically we will gain 1,065, I call them points, um, and in, and in fiscal year 25, we will gain um, 1,413. So overall, we'll have a, a gain of 347. Mm -hmm. um, so our total long-term weighted, weighted a ADM is basically this first column, add the weight, and then you get the total long-term weighted ADM. So you can see we're up 375.14. So basically, this, in, this will increase MVSD's um, tax capacity. There are some people that are going down just as much in, school, in different school districts. Yeah. <clears throat> Cora, can you explain this one? <coughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so if anyone was in the drive earlier, you probably saw about seven slides that basically did this. And I tried to put it into one this afternoon. Hopefully that's easier. Um, but basically it walks you through sort of the impact um, if Act 127 was in place for the current year 
um, in the current calculation and then what it might look like, it, what it would look like if Act 127 was in place and we were using long-term weighted at 8 a.m. in the current year. Um, so right now, and what you saw when we were developing your budget and what taxpayers are, are um, is reflected in taxpayers' bills is ed spending of 33,981, 33,981. We divide that by equalized people of the 1774 and we get the spending per equalized pupil. Um, they divide that by the property yield is 15,479. That's set by the AOE, or the state of Vermont, I'm sorry, set by legislature. And we get a tax rate of $1.24. Um, as I walk through this calculation, I'm going to show you how, to, how we get to the $1.24 with a new weighting. Um, if we applied the new weights that we just went through to the equalized pupil, so instead of the 1774 we would add the weight in we would get to this 18 22 36 so then you're taking the same number dividing by a, a higher number so obviously your spending per pupil is going to go down same property yield but we have a four cent reduction to our tax rate so you can kind of see how the new weights benefit mbsd um, what that would equate to um, is a two million sixty four thousand two hundred and twenty nine dollar increase to the potential increase to the budget to get us back to the dollar twenty four so if we had um, the equalized people under the new weights in 24 basically our, our our budget could handle an increase of two million dollars divided by the same um, long-term weighted uh, sorry equalized people with this with the new weights <coughs> And that would get us back to the dollar twenty-four. So that's just to kind of put it in perspective that this, if this if this law was in place this year and we were using equalized pupil, we we could have added two million dollars to our budget, and the tax rate would have been the same. Um, now, would that two million need to go to support and provide services for the newly categorized students? That's the intent of the law: is to make sure that it, the, the, well. The, really the intent of the law is to hit the high spending schools who have tons of services for students to be more even with the school districts that have, have been conservative and fiscally responsible um, to allow us to spend closer to what they spend and try to even the playing field um, uh, if we did if we looked at fiscal year 24 so this would be if act 127 and we were working with a long-term ADM so we no longer equalize pupils it's long-term ADM, so instead of an eight, uh, 1,882, it's that new number I showed you on the last spreadsheet, that's 2,865. So that's the, um, the ADM plus the, the new weight. Um, basically, um, to get us to the same tax rate, our budget could have been 34,420 instead of this 33,981. <coughs> so again, it just shows you the capacity that we gain mm -hmm. from from this change in funding. Yeah, that's with a lower yield. You'll notice here right. mm -hmm. that that Laura has lowered the yield to what the state is telling us to use as an estimate. Because obviously, with all the shifts, the state has to still raise the same amount of money as they do. So we expect to make it be. Instead of in the 15s, it should be the But again, you won't know until probably May. Right. Which is the tricky part. Mm -hmm. That's good. Timing is good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is really, it is really going to help with that. Um, we knew we would get a little bit of a bump, but we really didn't know. The, the extra capacity for one time <coughs> getting would jump in how many kids are categorized under uh, poverty uh, because that was such an such an increase for us. So Laura will probably expand on this a little bit more, but because this is a real change, um, schools who have had uh, much more tax capacity have paid their teachers a lot more, have had Cadillacs, if you will, uh, of uh, services and supports for kids, they're gonna need to be curbing their spending over five years. And then other uh, schools such as ours that have some increased capacity, excuse me, um, 
will be in the position of increasing our budgets to a degree. So they have sort of an on-ramp and an off-ramp there. Um, and one of the pieces is if you're spending per long-term ADM, what used to be spending per plus people, that number, uh, if it increases more than 10%, then that would trigger a review panel process. Um, I don't know if we know more about that review panel than we did last week, but at that time, um, there we think there will be some business managers and superintendents on a panel to review whether people's spending is excessive or not. I, I don't relish, I don't know who's gonna relish being on that, <coughs> but that is one threshold that people have to look at. And the other is the 5% tax rate cap. So if you are a Champlain Valley School District uh, and you change nothing in your budget, your tax rate is gonna be going up 25%. Uh, their tax rate is protected at a 5% cap for the next five years. But this applies to everyone. So Laura, if you explain a little more, but if you hit that 5% tax cap rate, you have some protection each year that you are above a 5% tax rate increase from year to year. So you get some protections there um, in case you have any su surprise increase. Um, if you don't meet that 5% tax rate cap, you don't get it in year two or year three through this on and off ramp process. And the intention really was to help the high spending schools reduce, but it also has an effect on schools such as ours that might be closer to a 5% tax rate cap. And then we have some decisions to make about what we want to do. Do we want to meet that 5% cap to perhaps protect us for the next year and so forth. And to Julie's example um, of CVU, so if they didn't cut and they continue to spend the way that they have traditionally, they would trigger the 5% the, the tax rate cap and potentially would only see that 5% increase over the next several years, but, but that does not alleviate the 10% spending per long-term weighted ADM. So they, it would still, if they went up in their long-term weighted ADM spending more than 10%, it would trigger a review. So they don't just they don't wouldn't just receive the the break, so to speak. They would they would still have to explain why their spending didn't go down. Um, I will add that it's interesting at hearing the different business managers and then the superintendents and things today, the take on this law and sort of the people are forgetting the intent already and yes. playing the victims. And so school districts like us are having to say, but you've been spending $20,000 per equalized pupil and we've been spending 15, <laughs> you know, for years and years and years. Um, but that's not necessarily the message coming from the people who are losing out of this. It's very much, uh, what are we gonna do? We can't cut everything, you know, so, which I understand, which is the whole point in the 5% um, tax rate cap is to give them time to do that. But it will be interesting watching the news and, and school board meetings and all of that as, as this budget season goes by because lots of difference of opinion and there's major winners and major losers in the situation. They lobbied hard against it. Yeah. So sometimes you have to accept the fact that you lost. <laughs> right. So this is just outlining kind of what this what the 10% uh, spending per long-term ADM weighted ADM threshold means for MBSD. Um, so the long and short of it is that this portion of the calculation is only based on the long-term weighted ADM threshold. It has nothing to do with the yield <clears throat> and it is the base for it um, is um, what our long-term weighted ADM would be for fiscal year 24. So if you look in column one, this is the calculation this year. What we have to apply to make it even, to compare apples to apples, we have to, we have to turn this current year into a long-term weighted ADM and use the larger number to get our spending per long-term ADM. So that's why it goes from 19 to 11. 
if we spend 10% more than that next year, it would be 13043 or an increase of 1185. If, so if MVSD chose to spend, we don't know what we don't know what 25 numbers are going to be, but regardless, if next year our long-term our spending for long-term weighted at ADM goes up um, $1185 or more, it will trigger a review by that committee. So it's just good to keep that in mind as we as we move forward. Not that we're going to be in this situation, but it puts it in perspective. And then I kind of tried to do the same thing for the 5% tax rate cap. Um, so this is only on the tax rate. So forgetting, so to speak, about the spending per long-term weighted ADM and just looking at these bottom numbers, um, which we are still, we don't have all the information for 25, um, but basically, our tax rate right now is $1.24, 5% more than that is $0.06. Cents. So next year, our tax rate cannot go over one, or if it goes over one thirty, excuse me, um, the, the rest of that increase, so to speak, would be forgiven. Um, and just, well, forgiven, it goes into the Ed Fund because the funds still have to go from somewhere. So all the people who go over the 5%, the, the extra or the above and beyond the 5%, those funds that need to be raised go off, go into sort of the big pool of the statewide ed fund. They still have to be raised, and that will impact what, what the yield gets, how the yield gets set. Um, but it won't be just the burden of MVSD or whatever school district it is. Um, and then, just as I said before, um, just because you kind of get this five percent safety cap doesn't mean that you are forgiven uh, or the ten percent threshold doesn't apply. It still applies, and some people will kind of fall in those different um, brackets. So the long and short of it is using 24's long-term weighted ADM and estimated yield, MVSD could increase spending for long-term weighted ADM by the $1,185 to the $13,043 without triggering the 10%. Any tax rate increase over $0.06 cents or $1.30 will not be realized by MVSD and allows MVSD to carry the 5% cap security through fiscal year 29. As Julie said before, if you don't trigger the 5% cap security in year one, you lose it in year two. If you don't trigger it in two, you lose it in three, and that's only in place through 29. Yeah. <coughs> it's a tricky one because uh, on the next slide, it's reminders about the <coughs> So we know the yield is going to be going down to equalize uh, how much uh, revenue the Ed Fund needs to support to all of our schools. Um, but it, it, they are asking business managers right this second to estimate how much money they're going to spend so that we can have our December 1 tax commissioner letter where there is an estimated yield that's shared with schools. Um, again, the yield is the amount the state would pay per pupil if the property would have tax in the dollar. Um, we do expect the tax commissioner's letter to come out December 1st. Um, and so they are trying to calculate what yield we should use for budgeting. However, with so many unknowns, schools who are going to hit the 10% cap and the 5% uh, tax rate increase cap, high spending schools, low spending schools, all of us trying to figure out the just right fit for our school budget given our particular circumstances if spending is a lot higher than expected, then the yield will go down further in uh, in the legislature, and we like. I think it will take them longer to determine what the yield will be. So we're going to have to be very careful in our communications to community members that uh, things are estimates and what we expect. It's going to be harder to calculate the tax rate. Uh, as cleanly as we usually do. Just to add to that, in the meeting that was today, and I don't know if you heard this, Joanne, in the VSBA kind of presentation to webinar today, but the tax commissioner could, and he did, I believe it was when we had the mergers happening in Act 46, he could create a December 1 letter with with um, different scenarios, um, yeah. depending on the different different spending that they might see. If he doesn't have confidence that the numbers that they're receiving from the school districts is is adequate enough, he could he could provide us with different yields depending on what the different spending looks like. 
hoping that does not happen, but they did talk about it today, which makes me believe it might. But the spending, the spending that's been reported to the AOE so far, so they always ask business managers this time of year, how is it looking? I think there were 40, or sorry, 38 school districts or something that had reported, and it was looking at over 10% spending increase um, in their net head spending calculation, which 10% is pretty significant. Which well, part? you think about the fact that we have the change in rates, Projections. and we have a loss of our BESSER funds. Based on draft one budgets and, that reported so far. Okay. Sorry, but, and then, of course, there are a lot of salary uh, and benefit increases across the state, but also the benefits. Um, have We are expecting an almost 17% increase in health insurance premiums this year. So those are fresh, all of those pressures are significant. Also, the pressures get compounded with Act 173 changes to special ed and the extraordinary mm -hmm. reimbursement. So some school districts that seem to be gaining in one area are gaining in several, and school districts that are losing in this area are losing in several areas. So it's, it's, it's pretty significant. The other thing I've heard recently is that there's a group of people who I want to make certain that the non-residential tax has changed because I think that the statement I read was that there's a belief that the residential tax is uh, increasing at a greater rate or, or carrying more of the load than the non-residential. That's interesting. I've heard that too. Though. I've heard I've heard that too, but it's interesting because I had thought in the in the law they all have to increase by the same percentage. So that's that's know. interesting. I'll find out more about that. I, I don't know, but I, I don't know if it was data or whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> It's interesting to me because my house part of it's non-residential, part of it's residential because it's rent. And just as a side note, I didn't put it in the presentation. All of these calculations happen before the CLA comes to play into play. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the real tax bills that people get are impacted by the CLA. This we're not even talking about that. Oh. <laughs> That's another part of the calculation. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we got towns that need Swanton needs a reappraisal. <laughs> That was good, helpful. Sorry, that they mentioned. And the, and the, the gist really is that our, our, our district is benefiting significantly. Um, we were not expecting to benefit uh, much. We knew we were on the positive side of the calculation, but because of the change in the way poverty is counted, our schools have gone from 30 something percent up to 60 percent, which is, you know, in, in the future years, we expect that to go up a little down a little, but stay in that same area. Um, but from FY 24 to 25, we get a significant bounce there. Uh, the other piece is Laura mentioned Act uh, 173. Uh, they are applying some kind of weighting. Uh, to the excess pupil, um, Extraordinary. I'm sorry, excess spending for high cost students, uh, and we are getting uh, a, a benefit from that calculation as well. So we are getting more revenue on that side of the equation, whereas Laura said some schools are getting less money for special education. Um, we tend, we, we are on the other side of that, of the positive side of that calculation. So I want to make sure I understand this. I know a lot has, this has been changing every day since our finance committee meeting. Um, on slide eight, is this showing us the net? I'm trying to understand if the- Slide eight, sorry, let me get there. Yeah. Um, trying to understand the net increase in tax capacity. Um, is it- Is that the $2 million? Is it the is it, is it the two million offset by the the one point six? Is it a is it a four hundred and? But that's only reflective of twenty four. This is just different scenarios. If it was in place this year, and so I know we were looking at some much larger numbers in the the first round of things there. The and other we day. still are from we still are because we will be going from twenty using twenty. 22 and 23 to 23 and 24. 
Okay, so that's the the next piece, and so that's worth right. So let me go more. here for a second. So here, where I'm using the twenty eight sixty five. Mm -hmm. If you look at this number here, I'm sorry, it's so small, but do you see this? This is the number I'm using in that calculation to create that in the current year. Gotcha. We're going up three hundred and seventy five more. Okay, and that's like a fifteen percent bump. It's and huge. That's. <laughs> And it's because if you look at poverty. So that, and that's like a $4 million increase in tax capacity, right? Roughly. Sorry. After today's meeting, I'm not, I don't really want to put numbers okay. to it. I will say that the numbers I have run, <laughs> I have run, I have, I'm confident in my calculations and I, and the numbers we are using because Rusty Gregory is a phenomenal data manager and he's on top of all of this, which is not the case for a lot of school districts. I, these I believe these to be very good numbers. I've run about eight different scenarios now based on what we talked about um, And it, it it's, could be much larger than that So we've been talking for a couple of years now about the funding cliff with the end of our professor dollars mm -hmm. and wondering what we would do knowing that we have really put in a lot of supports that our kids have needed and so, um, you know, I think this methodology is really the state kind of recognizing that there are schools like us that have been operating for years um, without the supports that some of our kids have needed. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I see this as an opportunity to, you know, to maintain some of those services that have been put in place over the years um, or over the last couple of years uh, using our Besser funds. But now it's really just the, the state reallocating, you know, a, a bigger piece of the pie to the to the districts that really need those supports more. So, um, you know, we don't have a draft of the budget, uh, but I think I think we need to balance. There may be a tempta temptation to back off some of the tax rates. Um, we had a big increase last year because of the uh, inflation around housing prices. Um, so we'll be balancing that with um, the extra tax capacity. Essentially, we can get, we can draw more out of the Ed Fund, more, uh, we can draw a bigger piece of the pie for our, our contribution. Um, so we should be considering uh, how much we decrease or if we increase or if we maintain that contribution um, to make sure we get our fair slice of that pie so the intent of this when it started many years ago was to make sure that those monies were used to improve opportunities for students and not just say well now we can cut our taxes mm -hmm. I can say every webinar training meeting I've listened to in the last two months they that they were beating that drum they are reminding yeah. people that sure, that's, that what, that's what the intent started. is supposed to be yeah. um, just to add one more thing because so much of our extra weight is coming from poverty and because our poverty went from 660 the ADM went from 661 to 1011 that jump will only happen this year I think Julie kind of alluded to that but our free and reduced price po population around 60 to 65 percent we're not going to see that jump next year we went from 30 to 65 this is kind of a one-time jump where we're going to get this 360 um, point five extra weight. Um, next year we will sort of plateau. It'll go up a but little. But it'll establish a new base, right? I mean, yes, yes, so yeah. Much beyond but that. you won't have this giant disbarance, though. Right. And this, that's that's what's kind of creating this huge extra amount of tax capacity. Yeah. So let's. Yeah. See. So we have it through. Um, <coughs> you know, we probably want to shift to the the budget draft. Um, or I don't know if you want to shift to the budget workbook as a way to show the budget draft, but you know, we have been looking at the positions that we did add. Um, many positions we that seem new were really trades for uh, uh, vacancies or when the numbers said we didn't need to fill this position anymore, but we added something different that we did need. But we have looked through the additional interventionists, a couple that we've added, a couple of those positions that really do get at the intent of this law. Um, so, you know, I think we will be in a position um, with board support to continue those 
services uh, that are supporting kids' growth. Um, whether it's their mental health and well-being or whether it's their ability to uh, perform academically. Those interventions, um, I, I think we are no longer in the position of uh, fearing that we have to come <coughs> back to pre-COVID times. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Um, so I passed out and it was in the Google Drive draft one of fiscal year 25's budget. I've created or started to create a, your new kind of board budget workbook which I'll keep adding to as we work through the different drafts. I think it worked well last year. Um, draft one as always includes salary and benefit increases only. So only the objects on the left hand side that are start with a one or a two. One is salaries, two is benefits and there's a lot of them. Um, one thing I will point out that I think probably will draw some attention as you look through um, is, um, let me just, let me go ahead and move forward. Um, so I did link in the budget development timeline that I shared with you already um, in your workbook. Um, some of the items that we will be looking um, for the board to provide um, direction on, obviously Act 127 and the, the tax rate considerations there. Uh, as Julie met, talked about, the ESSER transitions. Um, level service budget, so um, basically meaning do we provide the same services in this budget next, or next year that we're providing this year, or do we do something different? Um, we'll be looking for non-union professional support and administrative increases for budgeting purposes. There is a percentage increase calculated in here, um, but I will look for feedback as we uh, move along for anybody that's non-professional, I'm sorry, non-union. Um, prof uh, union professionals and union support are already negotiated for next year. We'll be looking for input on capital investments and working with the facility task force on that. And then um, also a discussion point should be the after school program um, support that is in the general fund. Um, no, these are our known ed spending factors. There's probably a lot more than this, but I tried to um, capture some of them here. Um, same, same as last year, but just basic transparency of what makes up education costs. We know that we're providing a lot of services in school districts now that we perhaps didn't in the past. <coughs> Demands on our staff um, and time and resources are high. Uh, ESSER funding expiration, Act 127 state ed funding change, uh, we also have Act 76 child care contributions, so there will be a new payroll tax that um, will mostly be the burden of employers across the state um, to provide this child care contribution. I'll talk more about that later. <coughs> Act 173, so that's the change in special ed funding. Um, we know that we had a slight decrease in our um, block grant last year, but that will increase every year based on ADM. So as you know, probably saw in our last slides, the ADM has been increasing, so it will be going up from year to year. Um, and also, we, MBSD is seeing a huge increase in extraordinary revenue. Um, higher cost students above a certain threshold um, receive a higher reimbursement. We have more students in those categories, but we are also receiving a lot more revenue because of the new calculation. Um, a couple of million dollars of extra revenue. Um, so it, it is significant. So that's another thing to, to think about. Um, also inflation, I mean, I guess I don't really need to explain that to you, but we are seeing huge increases in costs basically across the board. Um, we've noticed them very significantly with transportation, but supplies, material, trucking to get furniture and equipment to us, software, every, everything is seeing increases. Are we locked in on transportation that we just do the contract? We are, yeah, but even, um, well, field trips are negotiated also, um, but we do transportation for independent schools that are in our contracts, yeah. mileage reimbursements for certain students and families, so um, we are definitely feeling the impact of that. Staffing shortages and labor costs, we all know about that. Um, stu student needs, obviously, increasing or changing. Um, Julie spoke about the health insurance premium increase. Visbit has filed at 16.4%. They've also kind of put us on notice that next year won't be any better, um, could be worse. So that is a very significant cost to all the school districts. And then capital needs, 
um, which we're working with the facility task force on. And we bring re recommendations to you, but also state mandates and environmental policies, meaning um, PCBs and lead and radon and stormwater and <laughs> all the things that are Warm causing. <laughs> yes. So there are a lot of things on that list as well. Uh, so I have a, a link here to draft one, but you have paper copies as well. Let me move this over. <clears throat> this was what I was alluding to earlier and sort of stopped myself, but um, fiscal year 24 budget is the 44 million. Um, the actuals to date is this 42,929, and th that will come into play down here. Um, draft one, we have an increase over the budget of 1.2 million, so that's where we're getting this 46,229,182, or 2.77%, as you all have already seen on the back page. <laughs> <laughs> sure he does. You're right. Um, but I want to kind of draw attention to the increase over actuals because we have had a lot of changes with either staffing, positions, what positions they're in, who we're hiring, veteran staff, new staff, staff versus contracted services. So if you think about us doing this budget process last year and how many things have changed to that regard. Um, to, to date, it is quite significant. So um, that's why you're seeing the increase over the budget is the 1.2 or 2.7, but increase over the actuals is 3.2 or 7.77. So it's important to think about that as we're working through. Um, salary increase that's reflected in this budget is to 2,466,832 and benefits is 1,863,15. Um, so those are sort of known. As I said, we have negotiated increases already for professionals and support. That's great when you're budgeting and it doesn't happen every year. So we're pretty solid on those. We'll be looking for feedback for non-union, but those are a smaller piece of the pie. Um, but also paying attention to that other. So um, basically that million twenty-seven thousand will be reflected in your next draft because actuals are higher so i'm sorry lower so we have to find that money somewhere else so um that's the contract changes and and changes in trucking and all of those other costs that we have so in your next draft i would anticipate seeing seeing the increases um for that for the other million twenty seven dollars <throat> So the forty-two million FY twenty-four actuals to date. Mm -hmm. That's a projection based on what we are. It's now. a projection based on what I know right now, and we have made a very big commitment in our office and working with facility directors and principals and office staff to try to encumber all expenses that are known. So if there's a contract out there, we now have a process to create POs for that right away. Um, if there are supplies that are needed for facilities through the year, we try to calculate what those are and we create a PO that encumbers those funds for the entire year. We do the same thing for utilities. Um, so we, we try to, to ha make this number as accurate as possible, but there's obviously a lot of other costs that will come up and arise as the school year happens that we just can't predict. So I would say the biggest one is student related services obviously some of those contracts can come in and they're a hundred thousand dollars or maybe there's two students that come in at the same time and it might be two hundred thousand dollars so you have about two million dollars but the benefit increase is obviously having quite an impact 16.4 percent increase to health insurance leaves a mark mm -hmm. um, that's a good news the good news is Act 127. <laughs> yes. Show us the good news for sure. Thank goodness. Yeah, I know. Thank goodness is, is right. Um, so union professional staff, as I said, I've outlined the increases there for you, but the base salary is going up again. Um, the different increases for teachers based on the different steps that they're on. Uh, union support staff is negotiated. Um, basically, everyone's getting a step increase. It can be anywhere between 60 cents and a dollar. 60 cents would only be if they were on the grandfathered salary scale. A dollar um, is with the new scale. Um, Non-union in this budget, uh, in this draft for budget purposes only, I'm using 4% for all non-union staff. That was something we need to talk about. Um, benefit increases, as I said, 16.4% for Visbit. 
um, or Blue Cross Blue Shield and dental um, is going to be between two and three. <coughs> uh, we also have, offer other benefits, long-term disability, life insurance, and some of those, but the increases are either very small and actually yeah. they've gone down yeah. since we negotiated. Gwent Bonnie has been able to um, do some negotiating with them, and actually in the current year they went down from what we were projecting, so that's great. Um, Vistas Healthcare, that's that um, uh, fee that we pay on every new teacher to teacher retirement, in which we know we have quite a few that come through MVSD. Once we start to pay on those teachers, we continue to pay on them until they're not with us anymore. And so every year that amount per teacher goes up and there's we have to pay it. Um, the current year is uh, $1,509, so I'm estimating that it'll go to $1,650. That's about what it went up last year. Um, but um, I didn't. I, I will add those lines up in the next draft. I didn't have a chance to do that, but it's significant. Does it ever cap? No. Well, not that I'm. Not that I've seen yet or yeah. heard about. <laughs> Is it At some based? point, it's a payment on every teacher, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Think about it. Yeah. Some of us are getting closer than others. No. Uh, it's not, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, you're penalized if you're a school district that has more turnover in staff and that's not really fair and then the act, act 76 child care contribution that's new this year that's the payroll tax i was talking about that's a point point four four percent on every employee it is yet to be known if the full burden is going to be on the employer a small amount may be able to be put on the employee um, but what school districts are worried about is that may have to be negotiated into our master agreements. So it might have to wait until the next negotiation cycle because master agreements trump basically everything. So um, that has an impact as well. Um, that in this draft, I think it was a hundred. It's over a hundred thousand dollars. That's how much it'll impact. It's over a hundred thousand. I think it was like one hundred and six or something like that. Wow. Oh, and that's just the next, getting ready for the next draft. Uh, I did mention before some of you got here, the notes we have, I just ran out of time to be perfectly honest, but some of the notes have been updated, all of them have not. Um, we will update all the FTE numbers and things, but for the next draft, I know that's something you're usually very interested in. Um, the other thing is that um, this represents where, where teachers are funded right now. So, um, as far as um, I, I budgeted for staff with the same funding source as they are funded currently in this year, not necessarily where they're budgeted or where I will be putting them next year. If we keep those staff, those changes will be reflected in the next draft. So say a teacher's funded with ESSER right now this year, next year I've added the increase, they're still reflected in ESSER, but I will be moving them in the next draft to wherever we think they might go. So every position will be in that? They're all in here right now yeah, right, yeah. in the bottom line, but I'll be moving them out of grant funding, either title funding or whatever, and moving them around and, and absorbing them into general fund lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so and then, anything that was <coughs> we have had in the regular budget right along, as well as in the ESSER, you know, but it, it was recorded under the federal grant lines. We have some small contracts and uh, those kinds of things we may be continuing or not continuing, but um, they, they're all, they have been in the budget uh, in previous years, unless it was a very temporary short-term strategy. So the new numbers, Laura, what you said would include all those positions. So I'm not advocating this, but if if we wanted to reduce it, that would be looking at positions and whether we want to continue ESSER funded positions, right? As I said, I'm not advocating it, but when we look at that number, we see it and we say, ooh. Well, we, we sort of planned for some of it, right? So we knew this was coming. So la the last year in the, or in the current year's budget, we had, we had absorbed some of those positions right. already to sort of kind of. But we will be looking at the total number, not uh, say, well, this. The debate won't be over whether or not we're going to keep it in funding. <coughs> Are we going to keep it and keep the it's money that's already in there? Right. Okay. And Julie, myself, and Bonnie met with every single single building principal um, last week, and that's exactly what we were talking about. 
So when you talk about maybe reductions, you also probably the principals are asking for more stuff, I would imagine. Surprisingly, we didn't hear a lot of that this year. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, they're, they're really, it, it's interesting. I mean, we have some programs that we are looking into. Um, we're looking at creating some alternative program classrooms, uh, one in Swanton and one here at MVU. Uh, for middle level learners who are really struggling. And so we, we will look as we're budgeting to see whether we need to add anything for those or whether um, we have the capacity because maybe there was a classroom teacher we weren't able to fill uh, or, you know, those kinds of things. But, um, you know, we have to look at, at the revenue side of things uh, in this new uh, budget era and see you know can we keep those things the extra interventionist the social worker the you know truancy at home school coordinator those positions <coughs> have been very valuable uh and and we want to we, we're planning on keeping them anyway and using medicaid funding for it. i uh honestly i think we're going to be in a very strong position i had a board member once who said is this a swap we later and it came up quite often from him. On a swap, yeah. Matt, you want to add one? What are you going to take away? It's been a part of all of our well, conversations. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm always doing. So when I met with principals, Dan looked right at me and said, "I thought you were going to ask me for every single thing. What are you going to give up? Because that's what I'm generally doing." Yeah. Sure. Well, anyway, there's still a lot of good news there. I'm hoping with the next draft, I'll be able to, obviously we'll have a better idea of the bottom line because it will look at more of the cost, but also be able to share some of the scenarios with you with the changes in revenue and the ADM and all of that. I was going to do it tonight, but none of the other business managers were, so <laughs> I pulled it off. I decided not to, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Let's make it move it. Take one, take two, take three. <laughs> so happy to take any feedback, but incorporate that into draft two. two. I mean, I will just add, kind of like what Devin was saying earlier, I do think there's an opportunity here with where we are um, back when 27 and the different weights to kind of create a different base that I don't think we're just going to, I don't think we're going to have another year like this. No. And so. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, given especially with the poverty going up and like the services like we need to provide, I mean I think I think we just have to consider like, you know, everything we can do to take advantage of this year in this scenario. So I think more to come in some of those good finance committee debates. I did share that with the AOE too and it was interesting because they were like, Oh, no one ever thought about that when they were talking with legislature, but that 5% cap gives a safety net to school districts and allows them to do this over time. School districts who are benefiting, we don't want to complain, but we have a lot of decisions to make in one year yeah. because this is a one-time thing. It won't happen every year. So we don't get five years to plan. We get this year. It's tough to complain because we're getting all the money, but, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's between now and January, MVSD will have some decisions to make. It's almost like making not just a year budget, like a multi-year budget, mm -hmm. all in the same time. So but I, th I think we have to try to take advantage of this opportunity. I think we need to. Any other questions or comments? At the Finance Committee, um, just to be able to talk through some of these ideas, and um, it, it's, that's been a great help. On the agenda, we have business. Uh, we have warrants. Joanne. <laughs> Joanne. Ryan doesn't like to read Come on. <laughs> I don't math. Is that what you would say? 
So, uh, right? Not mathy. <laughs> Looking for a motion to approve the warrants. So, accounts payable uh, $1,313,492.96. Payroll checks $80,000. $414.09. Payroll other disbursements, $1,704,814.21. And payroll deductions, $672,090.95. For a total of $3,770,812.21. Would anybody like to make the motion to accept the warrants as read? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Devin. Second? I'll second. Thank you, Renick. Any questions or comments? <coughs> all right, seeing none, all those in favor? Please say aye. 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 Thank you, Kelly. Um, all those opposed? Motion carries 8 0. <clears throat> and then next we have the uh, tractor lease. <clears throat> I move the tractor waste so it can be presented by our chair. So Laura's got the two, uh, that's the, you get, is that the three and the four year lease? Oh no, this was just the information about the tractor. I thought you wanted okay. to talk about that no, first. that's fine. So if you remember, uh, I don't know how many meetings it was ago, we approved uh, the money to purchase a tractor. Um, that was needed for replacing a failing tractor, an older one. Um, but at the same time, um, we were brought the attention that we have a current tractor, uh, one of our larger tractors, um, that is not being used. So it's meant for the larger equipment, field mower, top dresser, uh, flail mower. But the way that PTO works on that tractor is not ideal for um, using this equipment because it's clutch operated and you hit the clutch and it stops and it screws up the mowing. So, and basically that tractor's not getting used uh, currently. Uh, and according to Jason, it hasn't been used in a few years. Uh, there's no use for it in the winter months either. Um, so what's that mean? That equipment that it's supposed to be running is being run by other uh, smaller tractors uh, that we have. So that's obviously creating more wear and tear. So we've got a tractor that's just sitting there and we thought, man, it doesn't make sense to have that investment. Um, it's not gonna go up in value. Um, we should try to move that if we can. Um, so uh, we've got a new uh, model that's a uh, Kubota. Uh, the M4D, it's a 73 horsepower uh, tractor with a loader uh, that we're looking to replace it with. This tractor will run all this equipment that we're looking at and it'll run it with no issues. And with the loader, we'll also be able to use this tractor for moving snow in the winter and other things. So it'll have much more use. Um, so we're getting a um, school discount um, municipal discount of $16,258.22. Um, the price of the tractor, I should have mentioned that for $73,901. Um, and then they're giving us a trade for that 2007 Kubota uh, for $16,000. Uh, so that leaves us at $41,643. Um, and then we have miscellaneous uh, freight, dealer prep, install, and loaded tires fee. Uh, which brings us to $48,878.61. So seeing this wasn't budgeted, we had asked, and I think it was Don's idea at the time, um, for Laura to look into leasing rates. What can we do uh, for leasing rates uh, over time so the payment wouldn't be so big this year? So I think she has that up there now. So the ones that, at, both at the same rate, uh, that's 6.97%. Um, one is for four years and one is for three. So you can see the three-year payment one is for 
$89.33, and if we do the four, it's $13,238.62. And so the cost difference between those two is only $1,684. So the, um, the committee decided that um, maybe to go with the four, or the second option, the four-year lease, uh, so the payment wouldn't be as big um, and the cost difference isn't um, really that significant. So that's what we looked at. I don't know if anybody has any questions. And my motion should have included using the four-year payment option. Yeah. And we have a, a line item in our, in our assessment that says that we have it. This would be easily absorbed in the future years. We haven't um, leased the last couple of years because ESSER funding has right. allowed us to have the cash flow not to do that, and rates have been pretty high. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was in the best interest of the school district. But as Julie said, there is a line item in the facilities budget for leases, and we currently are not paying on any because in the last three years we've paid the others off. Um, also, just kind of a point of interest. Um, in the facility task force drive which you all believe, i believe you all have access to um, there is a a spreadsheet that um, reflects all the equipment that we have across the school districts the year it was purchased what it is and then um, looking at a replacement cycle year proposal uh, that i've worked with the facility directors on so that we can start to plan for these leases so do we anticipate a carryover that at the end of this year that's large enough to accommodate purchase of this tractor right now it looks that way yes yeah we when we started this process it was back in september and we felt it was really early, it to, was be, too early enough. To, to be thinking about that um i it suppose did. that that is an option if we're willing to uh, to go that way yeah, yeah i mean seven percent if we can avoid paying seven percent i i think we ought to I, I don't disagree with this. I, I think it was a little early, even yeah. August, September. You know, this is a good example of, of what we're trying to do with head of maintenance. Jason, working with Laura, you know, brought this in. We discussed it. We looked at other options. Uh, so however we pay for it, I think your idea is great. But the idea is let's have a process that we're buying stuff we know we need and that we can take care of it. Uh, to have a tractor sitting there that's not appropriate for our use is ridiculous. Well, that's well, that's what Laura had up there with the equipment and then the schedule for replacement. That's what we needed because the problem is like this year we really needed two is because we haven't in the past been doing that. So we've got aged equipment building up. So how is the, I mean, the work that this tractor was purchased to do, you said that's being done by other right. equipment? The equipment we have doesn't quite match this tractor. So well, either the tractor's a, too big, the equipment's too small, the equipment's too big, the tractor's like, it just doesn't. So what do we gain by replacing this tractor versus just selling it and continuing to do what we're doing now? So the, the what Jason was telling me would be they're using tractors that are really not the correct size for the equipment they're using. So it's creating a lot more wear and tear. So we're figuring that those uh, tractors will uh, not last as long. So and, if, and everything's if, taken equipment because equipment because it's right. not the appropriate equipment, they have to stop and they have to need it. Right. right. The wood For instance, there's an attachment that goes on this that every time mm -hmm. they turn, they can't turn the way they're supposed to, and so it caused it takes way longer to do the fields than it should take. That's just one example, and mm -hmm. as Don said, it's creating a lot of wear and tear on equipment that it shouldn't be shouldn't have that wear and tear. And we pay the staff on the tractor hourly. So there's that. Do they just go home when they're done or are they just on to other things? It's just efficiency that way. They probably go on to other things, but there's a lot of other things. <laughs> and that, that's the other thing too, uh, Devin, is, is we're really looking to improve the athletics field, like we said. So there is other equipment. We need to get a, a spreader for fertilizer that this tractor will also work on so there's there's we need bigger equipment to to take care of these fields yeah. right now we do contract for a lot of that work too like cleaning ditches and you know things like that 
that we could do ourselves mm -hmm. and that Jason has expressed that he and his team would do rather than contracting for it. I think the administration with Laura and Dan are making certain that athletic department who has a role in the fields and the maintenance department which has a role in the fields are working together. I think here before, particularly when this is with all your high school separate entity, you found people maybe making decisions that weren't joint decisions. So we said, well, this is what you need, and I can bid it. When they got to, when it went to the guys that were going to use it, it's like, this, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing, but some of the discussions tell me that there were purchases made by people that uh, didn't take the time to thoroughly research how are we going to use it long term? What type of attachments do we use in equipment? Gotcha. And this purchase will let us get beyond that, I believe, and will be it. And that's a 2007 tractor, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not new. And the, and, uh, the 16,000 they're, they're giving us towards the other tractor, I'm not sure they'd give, it the, give us that if we just said, would you buy it from us? We, we aren't, we're not even sure that we can find one right now. So we had one. Yeah, there was one at the dealership looking. that when we first started talking about this, that sold the same day that we said we they, we were needed to wait. Um, they believe they can find another one, but mm -hmm. there isn't one like in the area. <laughs> we can also go back and say the will of the board is we want to pay for it. Uh, well, yeah, what, what, what do you guys think about I mean, I, lease? I agree with you. I'd rather not pay the interest if we don't have to. I just don't want to put us in a bad think, situation either. I think it's worth a try, personally. That if the vote was that uh, we offered to buy it out, and if we can't, then the backup position is we will accept which one of those offers. Because we're, I'll bring a financial report to the next board meeting, but because, or two board meetings from now, but because we're experiencing that increase of um, extraordinary reimbursement that I was talking about from 173, this is the first year we're receiving all of that. I didn't know how to calculate it, so I, I was very conservative. We're receiving a lot more money than what we originally thought, and the costs have not gone up. They've gone up some, but not, not to that scale. Okay. So that has provided us with quite a, a revenue, you know, or, or a surplus overall. Okay. So, I mean, I guess for what it's worth, I'd be supportive of purchasing. Uh, <coughs> I'd be supportive of the lease. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, the important thing. Are you is, making that motion, Devin? Well, was there a motion on the table already? I think there. I think so. Yeah. I think there is. I'll so. my motion. Well, no, my motion was to purchase, but I, I didn't have the option. In, but let's make a new motion. Go ahead. Well, I don't even want the option. I just won't buy it. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. And make that uh, what's Sorry. the dollar amount here? Oh, so it's uh, here. Let me look. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've got forty-eight thousand eight hundred and seventy-eight dollars and sixty-one cents. Okay, that's got the right one. All right, I'll make a motion <coughs> to uh, approve the purchase of uh, it's the seventy horsepower with loader and five forty PTO uh, tractor for forty-eight thousand eight hundred seventy-eight dollars and sixty-one cents. Right. I'll second that. And the purpose I made it before I wanted to let people know that uh, we really wanted this. Unit, or we got it. So that's good. Thank you. So, so Don seconded. Devin's first, Don's the second. Any discussion and or questions or comments? References? I'm with Devin. I prefer not to pay 7% interest if we don't have to. Mm -hmm. It's pretty high. I do appreciate you giving the options. <laughs> Honestly, I thought it would be a lot higher for that low amount in a lease i was expecting it to be like 12 or 15 so i was surprised it was seven but yeah i agree with you all those in favor please say aye. Aye. aye 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 thank you kelly all those opposed motion carries eight zero all right um roof contract all right so do we have the so show what we're doing? For some reason, Google is not giving me the image that you wanted, in which, oh. and I don't know why. So I have the schedule, but it's not giving me the picture. I'm not sure why that would happen, but. So this is phase, this is our second time around. So is, the, is this the roof? I don't know the pods. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So this, yeah. This so is this is the, one. it's the, it's a bigger section. It's the one coming in the front and you're coming in. This so, is the A pod then. Mm -hmm. And we did the two the on the sides already, which were phase A and B. Is this 1.3 million? Um, nope, we got it down. It was supposed to, the original estimate was 1.6. I told them Just that so number really. wasn't good enough <laughs> a couple times, and they came back with 1097. Okay. That's quite a drop. So it, it's it's part of the... It took a month or so. <laughs> you can see phase uh, 1A and 1B have been completed, so it's the down. it's the APOD and phase 2 that, that we're so. looking at. It's a little bigger, uh, but you can see we're actually doing it for about the same price um, as the others. Uh, it worked out really well. I, were you, they're going to use the same contractor that I believe so. That's the, the plan. Yeah, yeah. 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 and they were really happy. They were great. Uh, it worked really well last year. Um, so uh, there is a contract out there. I yes. didn't read the whole thing. It to be approved, or we won't be getting the approved. contract is it's the stamp, the exact language that EEI always uses. Yeah nothing to be concerned about. So I'll move the purchase of, of the signing of that contract or accepting of that contract to the amount that Peter indicated. 1097000 I'll second that. All right. John's the first, Peter's the second. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Vote. Motion carries 8 0. Sorry, I don't know where that's coming from. I think it's Kelly. Oh, background. No. Right. Next is the air purifiers, Peter. Oh, yeah. So, um, our last. Uh, Facilities meeting, um, I don't know if you have that one up there. Yep. So um, we have all these air purifiers and we have to have uh, cells replaced and filters. So um, Laura and Jason went out and got uh, a couple of options. Um, well, we already had, right, a, a contract or not a contract, but we had uh, a price for those we're able to lower those significantly and you can see option one in green and option two in uh, tan so that they're both really the same option the only difference right in the one in green is that Jason's crew and Steve and Franklin would be replacing the filters ourselves instead of having them come in and do it correct um, so that saves us uh, about five thousand dollars, uh, five thousand two hundred fifty dollars. And talking both Jason and Steve, it doesn't seem like um, uh, an issue for them to change the filters. Um, but the cells are a different story, so they do have to come in uh, and change the cells. And when they do that, they'll change the filters at the same time. So we're buying enough um, to get us out through June of 2026. Correct and we'll be purchasing these through ESSER funds, but wanted to bring it to your attention, um, you know, to, to you know, praise uh, Jason <coughs> and his staff and Steve from Franklin uh, for being willing to uh, change those filters uh, for us uh, to save us some money um, and to show that we were able to get a better price on these filters but also that um, the cost, you can see that um, even though it's still a, a significant cost, so we need to look at this in the future, um, you know, after 2026 to see, um, you know, with our improvements with air handling, um, that maybe we can start uh, moving away from this. I know that the, the teachers, uh, you did a survey, right? Mm -hmm. That survey right here that uh, they, uh, they are using them, they do appreciate them, <coughs> we want to keep them going. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, we are putting in like in Highgate and other schools, uh, new HVAC systems. So we're hoping that um, eventually we can uh, start removing some of these. So. 
just wanted to give that update. Thank you, Peter. Future agenda items to be communication update and planning uh, committee updates tour of the Franklin project. Super excited. Um, budget. Yes. Well, also, uh, JR can come to Franklin. We're going to talk about budget communication. We put together, you know, he'll share some some uh, data as well. Thank yeah, the addition they did speak of that in their last meeting, and it is coming along good. I, I walked down there over the mm -hmm. weekend. Um, the windows are—I don't know if they're in. They were supposed to be in today. Not in the building, but. In as far as um, available, so uh, the next few weeks there should be some uh, roof going up and <coughs> windows in and mm -hmm. getting it closed up. So um, I think we're a little behind schedule on that, but uh, but uh, it is progressing. While well, all the the concrete work's done, the sidewalks are in, the steps are up. It's it and. Uh, if you, you'll see it when we meet there, it, it looks really nice. It's really come together. So, John, John Brown integrated. Did we have the building secure by November, end of November, end of November. Yeah. yeah. So we'll do a nice tour next time in Franklin, <coughs> uh, which will be November twenty eighth at six o'clock. And do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? All right, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Peter makes a motion to adjourn the meeting at 8.35 p.m. And second is by Rennick. All, any, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 8-0. Peter Rennick. Thank you. Take care of that question, Yeah, it's up.